All right, so we're going to go ahead and uh, get started today. Today's a little bit different. I don't have uh, a traditional lecture with slides to show you to get started. We're going to jump right in. And this is really about kind of assembling pieces and collaging in Photoshop. So today is fundamentally fabricating a scene. So we're taking elements, and in this case, it'll be the people that we cut out last class, and we're going to manually insert them into a scene where they don't belong and we're going to try to make it as realistic as possible. And so there's two different scenes that we'll be working with. We'll be doing an urban scene where we have hard pavement um, that's a little bit different in how we treat shadows. And then we'll do another scene where we're in like a grassy field and we have a, a, a nature context because how we treat shadows and how we treat the people is a little bit different. So I'm going to walk you through both of those strategies. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now, and I'll show you our lab exercise. Give me just a second to get organized here. Perfect. OK, so I have the uh, remote desktop already open here, and I've gone ahead and I pulled up our exercise 108. This is what we're doing today. Um, and we're going to kind of work through several parts. Uh, the first one is we're going to select a scene. Uh, one's going to be natural landscape, as I said, one's going to be an urban scene. I'm actually going to start with the urban scene because I think it's a little bit easier than the natural environment and we'll build our way into the natural environment. Uh, then we're going to pick some images that we're going to integrate. These would be people and I'll show you how that process works. Hopefully you'll be able to use the people that you cut out last class. If not, you'll have to find some people to work with. Uh, there are a bunch on the old website, uh, my old website, that you can download and use if you want. Um, and then we're going to, you see right here under part three, we're going to repeat it. And we're going to pick the opposite. So we did the urban scene first, we'll do the uh, nature scene second, and then uh, you'll get practice in both um, areas. So I have some street scenes already pulled up. and. These are ones you can pick your own, and I have no problem with you picking your own, but these are all ones that I've found work pretty well. I will go ahead and open some of these in a new tab just so you can see. We'll come back and we'll visit the um, landscape scenes in a little bit. But these scenes are all similar in that there's no people in them. I think one of the best ones that we can do is this one. And I use this one as a prime example uh, each year because I really like how it, how it turns out. This one's actually not too bad either. Um, but again, all of these scenes have no people in them. So if you were picking a scene, that's what you'd be after. I'm gonna use this one as my example. Actually, since I, well, I like this curb because I think it's a good uh, illustration. So I'm gonna go ahead and use this one as my example. I'm gonna click on this little download button in the lower right corner and we'll download the original size. There it is. And then I wanna go ahead and open it up in Photoshop. So let me show it in its folder. There it is, it's in my downloads folder. I'm gonna go ahead and just right click on it and say open with Adobe Photoshop. Alternatively, I could open up Photoshop first and then um, open it from within Photoshop, go to file and then open. Got to give Photoshop a little bit of time to open up here. And there we go. There's my scene. I'm going to press Control Zero to zoom so that I fill the whole screen. And then really our first step when we start to think about integrating people into a scene or integrating objects into a scene is to do some analysis of what's really happening in one of these scenes. And one of the key things that we want to look at is where is the light? So in this particular scene, the light is coming from the upper right corner and shining down to us. So it's slightly behind where the camera is. So how do I know that? Well, I know that by looking at a few key elements. I'm going to, and this is not something that you need to do, I'm going to go ahead and create a layer so that I can draw some lines on it. Uh, and again, this is for me to draw so that I can illustrate some points here. But what I'm looking at is I'm looking up here and I'm saying, okay, here's a light fixture. What's happening with its shadow? So its shadow is right down here, cast on the wall. So we have an idea that the sun is shining down 
on approximately that angle. We could find other kind of key pieces. So if we look at this edge right here and we follow a shadow down, it's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of that edge. So maybe that's our shadow line. It's a little bit harder further down in the street because we're losing some of the, the shadow, but I think we're, we're doing pretty well at understanding that general line. So I'm kind of looking at that as a guide, right? So there's my height and it's coming out here and creating that little bit of shadow. Oops, I'm off a little bit. It's more like that. So with that in mind, I can start to think about how do I integrate a person into this particular scene? I'll go ahead and turn that off for a second. So I've thought about the lighting conditions. Now it's time to figure out who it is that I'm going to bring into the scene. So this is where you want to go and look at some of your other cutouts. So I would come in here and we can go back to exercise 107. Here's some cutouts. And I can look at some different cutouts. Now, as I start to look at these cutouts, right, I want to look for lighting conditions, general lighting conditions. So if I took this woman who's running, for example, that's good. And I'm just kind of kind of look at her. Okay, 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 okay. And I want to just kind of look at what's happening. So it looks like she's got some shadow on her face. So we could see the hat here casting a shadow down on her face. That's not inherently bad because the shadow is, but it's on the left side of the scene rather than the right side of the scene. So that would be okay, but we'd have to flip her around. So this is a pretty good candidate to bring into the scene. Let me go ahead and uh, close that for just a second. And whoops. Of course, I lost my stuff here. Hold on. Did I lose my whole? All right, hold on. I seem to have lost my remote desktop. Let's try that one again. There we go. Not sure how that happened, but I must have clicked the wrong close icon. There we go. So I have other ones. So I could look at this one, for example. All right, well, this one, the, 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 the light is in front of us shining back, the shadowed side is on us. So this really isn't that good of a candidate. So let's close that. Let's look at maybe this person. Okay, so again, the, the sun is kind of behind this person and the bulk of the person is in shadow. So I think that first one was actually probably the best one. It was this lady here that was running. Now I could go through and look at some of my other images and decide which one I wanted to pick, right? This one is kind of neutral lighting. So there's not really anything too exciting about her. I could probably make her work. But let's use that first running woman, this one. So in order to bring this in, I'm gonna go back to Photoshop and I'm going to go to File and then Place Embedded. So the difference between place embedded and place linked is that place embedded actually drops the full file into your Photoshop file. The linked, you have to maintain the link. You have to keep that file on your flash drive before you lose it. We're not really worried about space right now. So creating a linking file structure is not really necessary. We'll get to that when we get to InDesign. But instead, I'm going to go to place embedded. And when I choose place embedded, I have to go find that cutout. So there she is and we'll go ahead and place her in place. So if she's here, obviously she's way too big. So how do we decide what's the right place for her to go? Well, what we wanna look for is kind of what is our general horizon line? So if we were looking out at the ocean, where would that horizon line be? Well, in this scene, we're looking slightly downhill. So our horizon line's probably a little bit higher. It's probably right about there. So if we put the person in the scene, we want their eyes to be roughly on the horizon and they'll start to feel like they belong in the scene. So if I, if I move her down so that she's roughly on that horizon, we'll see that she seems to be about the right scale. Now, if I wanted her to be further away, I keep her eyes roughly on that horizon line and I make her smaller. If I want her to be closer to me, I still keep her eyes roughly on that horizon line and then she can be a little bit larger. I'm gonna make her just a whisker smaller because I want her feet to be right about here. And I'll just, now this is one of those things where you can really tell. So if I were to make her this big, you'd say, oh, that doesn't work. 
And if I were to make her this small, you'd be like, that doesn't work either. So there is kind of a sweet spot and you kind of naturally understand where that is. But if you can identify where that horizon line is, it helps. Now, not the horizon is not always perfect for every person. There's shorter people, there's taller people. You're just looking for an approximation. So we've got her there. Now, remember though, her shadow was on the wrong side. So I can go ahead and commit to this size. I'll click this little check mark here, but I need to flip her so that her shadow's the correct direction. So with that layer selected, the woman running color, I'm gonna go up to my um, image, oh, excuse me, edit, I can't talk, it's Monday morning. We're gonna to go to edit, and then we're going to look for transform. And we have some flip horizontal and flip vertical, right? I believe it's flip horizontal that gets us there. There we go. And now if we look at our shadow, it's approximately correct. So that gets us into the starting place. So I'm always looking carefully at the image that I'm trying to bring in, because if the shadow's wrong, it won't feel real. So we're trying to fake it. And we're, you know, in an ideal world, everything would be perfect, but we're doing the best we can with what we have. So now that she's in the scene, we need a way to make her feet not feel like they're floating. So if you look right now down at her feet, her feet absolutely feel like they're just floating or they're cut out and put on top of the scene. If you were to cover up, you know, from her waist down, the top part could be in the scene. But the bottom part is most definitely not. It's sitting on top. So how do we solve that problem? Well, we're going to bring in that silhouette that we created last class. So I'll go to File and then Place Embedded again. And I'm going to find the woman running gray. So this is the silhouette that we created last time. There it is. And I'm going to shrink this down so that it matches up with her approximate height. So now remember that this, there we go, is backwards because we haven't transformed it yet. If I need help placing this, I can use the arrow keys on the keyboard, but I'm trying to get her height correct. So her height's correct. That's good. I'll go ahead and commit to it. And then I need to flip it again. So I'll go to edit, transform, and we're going to flip uh, horizontal. And now if I were to move the shadow, I could place it basically right on top of the, the person and it'd be the same size. So that's great. This shadow though, obviously isn't standing upright. We need to get it down on the pavement. And so to do that, we're going to use another transform strategy. We're gonna go up to edit and under transform, right? Previously we did the flip horizontal. We're gonna come down here to skew. So it's under edit, transform, and then skew. And when you choose skew, you have the ability to move each of the corner points. So I can move this point over here. I can move this point over here. I can move this point down and you kind of work your way around until the shadow starts to feel like it's at the correct angle. So it's not quite at the correct angle yet, right? This foot, by the way, is slightly up. So we're gonna have a little bit of a shadow being cast there, but we need to keep working at our corners. So let me bring that one down just a little bit. Like that, we'll pull this one back just a little bit like that. Like that. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to get it flat enough to feel like it's down on the ground. And this does take some practice, I promise. We're trying to look at the angle of the shadow. So I'm looking at the, the light posts that I was looking at earlier. I'm looking at this lamp post, trying to get these two to start to line up correctly. Right, we can keep moving them around a little bit like that. And that's pretty close to what we're after. So again, it's just a matter of moving these corners and adjusting. I'm looking for overall length of shadow. That seems about right. So once I like it and I've committed to it, we'll go ahead and check this box. 
up here at the top ribbon. And now the shadow is on the ground. But shadows aren't opaque like this one is. If we look over here at the shadows, we can see through the shadows. So here comes an opportunity to use one of our blending modes, like what we talked about last class. So if I select the layer here and I go up to my blending mode, we can switch to a multiply blending mode and we can start to see through what would otherwise be our shadow. Now, the intensity of this shadow is obviously way higher than the intensity of this shadow. So we'll come over here next to our opacity and we'll drop that slider down until the transparency seems to be about the same level. So yeah, it's right in there, high 50s. So we're looking at that transparency. Yeah. That seems pretty reasonable in terms of a shadow. The other thing that it, we can see in these shadows is that the edges aren't quite as crisp. We look at my shadow edge and it's really, really sharp. These shadows don't have as sharp of an edge. So it would help if we blurred that edge just a little bit. So I'll keep her selected, keep the shadow selected. And I'll go up to filter. I'm gonna go to blur and I'm gonna choose a Gaussian blur. And our blur is probably somewhere in the one pixel range. And you can actually see that it goes from being sharp edged to having a little bit of blur. We could up that to two. Let's see, yeah, maybe two is about right. One and a half, 1.5. I'm just softening the edge of that shadow a little bit. Again, I can turn on and turn off the preview. There it is sharp. And there it is blurred just a little bit. And we'll go ahead and say, okay. We may need to fine tune the positioning. It looks like the, the shadow could move just a little bit more. I'm just using the arrow keys on the keyboard to kind of fine tune it there. Right about like that. So that feels pretty good. And if we look down at her feet, it starts to feel like, yeah, she's actually kind of integrated into the scene. This is not bad. So with that, right, we want to look at some of the more pressing details. So if I look at the general tone, and I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. I'm going to hold down space bar to pan. If I look at this shadow and I compare it to this shadow, or if I look at this shadow and I compare it to this shadow, notice that the color of the shadow isn't quite the same. This has a little bit more blue in it. So because of that little bit more blue, it wouldn't hurt to put an adjustment layer on just the shadow. So let me go up to layer new adjustment layer and let's do I'm going to try a color balance and now with the color balance we want the color balance to apply only to the layer directly below it so if for example I applied it universally it would tint the whole image so it's tinting the the the, the background it's tinting everything I want it only to tint the shadow. So to do that, I can go up to layer and I always do this with command keys, but I want to try to, right? You can choose create clipping mask. So it's layer, create clipping mask, or you can press control alt G. And when you do that, you'll see that a little arrow ties this color balance layer to just the shadow layer below it. And obviously, I tinted it in the purple direction. But what we're looking to do is to tint it a little bit more into the blue direction. So as I slide this up, that's too far. That's pretty close. So I'm looking at the shadow here. I'm looking at the tone of the shadow here. I'm looking at the tone of the shadow here and trying to get that color tone about the same. I may need to adjust the intensity of the shadow just a little bit to make it a little bit lighter. There we go. So let me press um, control zero again, so we can zoom out. Oops, control zero, no, come on. There we go. And so our shadow should look very much like this shadow in terms of color, it's awfully close, which is what we're after. So that's how we would put a person into a scene and make it feel like they belong. Josh, you're saying, would we normally put the shadows layer over the woman's layer? I'm not quite understand your question.
can you clarify the, uh, the for the the layers as in like the yeah. yes okay so the order of the layers so it it depends it doesn't have to be above the woman's layer it depends on whether or not the shadow you know, the the woman needs to be on top of the shadow or not and in this case i left a little bit of a space there because this foot is up in the air. It hasn't hit the ground yet. So I have a little bit of space before the shadow, in which case it doesn't matter. If I had a person um, where, whose foot was firmly on the ground, then yes, the woman running might be on top of all the other layers. So it doesn't make a difference here, but it potentially could make a difference um, with a different person. So Continuing in that vein, I'm going to do another person here because it doesn't hurt for you guys to see me do this again, but this time I'm going to have the shadow fall across this curb and we'll have to deal with the curb. So let's bring in another person and I probably need to go back and look at my cutouts here. What about the color of the woman? So the color of the woman, um, if you feel like it's too strong, it's too, uh, you know, a, bold for this particular image, you could do a saturation adjustment on her. So we can do the same thing on the woman running color layer. We can go up to layer, new adjustment layer, and let's do a hue and saturation adjustment on her. But we have to do the same thing where we tie this layer to only the woman running because we only want it to affect the woman. And to do that, we'll go up to layer, create clipping mask, or press Control Alt G on the keyboard. And once it's tied, there's that little arrow that shows us. And we can adjust the saturation. So we can drop the saturation down, which probably is appropriate. So there we are where she's fully saturated. This image is a little bit more muted. So dropping the colors down actually makes a lot of sense. Good question. OK, so let me bring in another person. And I need to take another look here at my people. See who I can bring in here. Uh, shadow's not quite right on that one. Well, we'll go with this kind of generic lady. We'll do her. She's not the best. In, in reality, I would spend a little bit more time trying to find another one. Let me go to File and then Place Embedded. So same thing. And actually, before I do this, just for clarity purposes, we know all of the layers here. So we've got this layer, we've got this layer, and the two adjustment layers. We could select all of them. I'm going to hold down Shift and select all of those layers. And then I can come over here to this little folder icon, and I can make them into a group. So it's called group one. If I double click it, I could say woman running. And that can help your overall like organization. So I can say the woman running. And now we can continue on with a new project with a new person. So it just helps, helps when you start to have lots of layers. Let's go to file, place embedded. And I'm going to use this lady. There she is. So same thing. We need to get her size about right. But I'm going to push her back a little bit more so she's standing more over there. She might need to come down a little bit more. And about like that. So I'll go ahead and commit to her size. Her shadow is not terrible. It's not the best, but it'll work. Right, probably would be a little bit better if she was flipped the other way because this leg is in sh slight shadow. Unfortunately, I like her looking this way. If she flipped her, uh, if I went to edit and then uh, free trans, or excuse me, transform, flip horizontal, she's kind of looking off in this direction, which isn't as good for the composition. Um, but from a lighting standpoint, this is probably slightly better. So it's kind of hit or miss on on which one you want. But okay, let's go with it. So there's the woman. Next thing we need to do is bring in the shadow. So I'll go to File and then Place Embedded again. And we're going to pick her shadow. And we'll shrink her shadow down. Let 
they don't have to be exactly the same height, but we're looking for kind of an approximation. So that's pretty good. I'll commit to it. Then I'm going to flip it. So I'll go up to edit and then transform. And once again, I'm going to flip horizontal so that she's facing the other direction. And they're awfully close to each other. So now it's time to use that skew tool again. So I'll go up to edit, transform, and we'll choose skew. And once again, I have to work her shadow into its appropriate position. So it's kind of this over and adjust. Let's pull that back. I need to adjust her feet here. Okay, so this time I do have two feet to kind of work from. So one of the feet there is going to be underneath her. This needs to come back a little bit more. I'm still working on getting it flat enough. Not quite there yet. The good news is the shadows are fairly forgiving. So if you, if you have it where it's off a little bit, you can always keep kind of tweaking it and get your adjustments correct. Sorry, I'm working on it there. Okay, so let's say that that's close enough for right now. Now, this is an example where we'd want the woman to be on top of her shadow, right? Because we want the, 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 the shadows being cast in the correct direction there. And right here, right on the shadow, we've got a problem because we've got a curb right there. So this shadow needs to fold up and around the curb like it does here needs to go up and then back. So I need to make some adjustments. I need to make some modifications to this shadow in order for it to look realistic. Now, right now, I can't really work with the shadow because it's still a placed image. It hasn't been rasterized into the scene. So in order to, to adjust this shadow, I actually need to go in and take the layer and rasterize it. I'll right click on the layer and I'm gonna choose rasterize layer from that list. And you'll see that it goes from having this little file icon next to it to not having a file icon next to it at all. So I'll choose rasterize layer. And again, that's a right click. The file goes away. And now I can actually start to manipulate this. So I could take the polygonal lasso tool right here. And I could cut this shadow right at the bottom of the curb. So I could cut it right there. like that. And then I could use the move tool to actually move this straight up. And now it's falling on the upper edge. Now I need to fill in that part in between. Now, technically speaking, some of this shadow would actually fall on the in between part. And I could skew it and whatever. But I think for our purposes, it would actually be just as easy to fill that in with some shadow and call it the day. So I'm going to go back to my polygonal lasso tool. I'm going to zoom in. I'll press control plus twice. I'm going to hold down the space bar so I can pan and look closely here. And what I'll do is I'm going to create a brand new selection that goes from this corner right up to there. Looks like there's a slight problem with getting my lines up here, and then we'll go ahead and select that. Now I want to fill with this same gray. So to fill with that same gray, I can use my paintbrush tool, but I need to know what that gray is. So in order to know what that gray is, I can use this eyedropper tool right here. And this will actually let me sample the color gray. And you see that my color now is that color gray. Right? So I can, I can sample that color gray. It becomes my foreground color. Now I can use my paintbrush tool and I can simply just paint in that part of the shadow. Let me paint it in like that. Can you take the color from the other shadow, shadows in the picture? Well, so that's, that's a little bit dangerous. Yes, I could. I could sample that shadow color, 
but then it wouldn't match this, my existing shadow. So I want it to match the existing shadow because I'll show you how I copy it a little bit later on, because I'm going to, to work with this whole shadow as a unit. It's all on this layer. And I want to go in and change the opacity, uh, excuse me, change the blending mode, just like I did with this shadow, where if I were to copy, right? So let's, let me do another colored region over here. Let's pretend there was a shadow right here. And I were to eyedropper that color. If I were to paint it, it wouldn't, uh, let me jump over to my paintbrush here, right? It matches this gray, but it's not transparent. And when I go to make this one transparent through a blending mode, it won't match as well. So it's better to match the same gray initially, change the blending mode on that shadow to match what we did last time. So we'll go to multiply. And remember our opacity was at, I think 55%. And what we can do is we can look back to what we did because the grays are the same. We can look back in here and we can say, okay, what was our, um, it was 48%. And we also had this color balance on it. So let's go back up here. Let's change this to 48%. Now, if you remember from last time, we were able to copy a particular layer by holding down the Alt key on the keyboard. So I can actually take this color balance that I created already, hold down the Alt key on the keyboard, and I can drag this up. Oops. Why did it not? There we go. So I've made a copy of it. So I held down the Alt key. I made a copy of it. It's applying to everything which I don't want. So we have to go up to that layer, create clipping mask. And now it's applying just to that shadow. So basically, because I already created it here, I'm copying the same layers to recreate the shadow. Does that make sense? So with that color balance, we have our shadow. I still need to do that Gaussian blur on it. So let's select the layer with the shadow. Let's go up, go up to filter. Let's go to blur, Gaussian blur. And I did it at one and a half, like I did before. We'll say, okay. And now if we were pressed control zero to see everything, we could see that her shadow now falls and wraps up over the curve, which starts to integrate her a little bit better. So these shadows are not easy to, to set up, but this is the strategy for doing it in an urban scene. So I did not merge the shadow onto one layer. I, I have another, shadow here for the woman. Uh, this is for the woman with the book, I guess I should be clear. Uh, and that is distinctly separate than the shadow for the woman that's running. So I want to keep them the same. The only thing that I did is I copied, sorry, my little uh, clicks are uh, covering up what I'm doing. The only thing I did is I copied my color balance that I had created for the shadow up here. So I just made a copy of that. That's holding down the alt key and dragging the layer. But how did it apply to all three pieces? It, the, the color balance applies only to the shadow. So if I were to take, let me turn off the woman. She's independent. We can turn off the woman with the book. The shadow is here and its color balance is right there. So these two are applying just to each other. The color balance is applying only to the shadow on the lady with the book. And the lady with the book is independent. Okay, when you made the adjustments to that shadow, it was it was to the, that layer. I... Right, the adjustments is tied specifically to the shadow layer only. No, I mean, but when you cut it in half and added it and painted on it, it was- it yeah, was It's all on layer. one layer, right, oh. exactly. It's all on one layer. So the part that I painted was on the layer. I was on that layer the whole time. So okay. if we were to turn everything off, just for clarity here, right? This shadow is all on one layer. Okay. It's this layer right here. Now, the other thing, I didn't do it this time, but you can, if you want, you can rename these layers to be a little bit more obvious, right? So woman with the book probably isn't bad, but I could call this uh, woman book shadow. And maybe that makes it a little bit clearer to know that that's the shadow for this woman with the book. Just like I did with the woman running, if I select the woman with the book, and her shadow, 
I can then click on this little uh, folder to create a group. And so we could call this woman with book. I'm sorry that this keeps popping up in the way so you can't see it. There it is, woman with book. And then I can turn the background back on and you can see them in their context. So that's integrating a person into an urban scene. Scene, it's about the pavement. It's about creating the, the stark shadow on the pavement with a little bit of a blur to match the existing and to match the color of the shadow. When we go, I'm going to do a save before I move on here. Let me do a, a save as. And let me put it into a folder for today. Whoops. There we go. And we'll say this is city scene. And I'll click save. Okay, perfect. Now, when I'm all done and I'm ready to, to post this, um, it would be a file and then an export, export as. And we would just choose probably a JPEG in this case. Doesn't need to be an MG. Could be. And then we go ahead and click on export. Now it's time to move over into our other scenes. Let me close up these scenes. We'll open up some examples. The reason I follow these links is just so that you don't have to spend. We can't hear you. How about now? No, it's okay, thanks. Okay, maybe I pinched my microphone cord. Thank you for stopping me. Um, so I'm giving you these sample scenes just because I'm trying to make your life a little bit easier, right? So here's a, a meadow scene with some grass, right? Here's another meadow scene with some grass. I actually don't like this one too much because uh, your person would end up being too far away to do the grass. And then in the foreground here, it's kind of like an urban scene. So maybe don't use that one. Right, this one's pretty good because it has long grass. It'll get you a lot of practice with the grass. Uh, and this one's not bad. The challenge here is that the shadow is so short. So any of these kinds of scenes would be just fine. I'm gonna choose this one, oh, excuse me, this one as my example. So I'll click on the little download link and we'll download the original size. You could, if you don't like any of those, you could, you could search for your own. Um, let's do a, I'm going to go into unsplash and let's, do, uh, right. We could pick any one of these. Don't pick this one because the sun's shining at you, right? Here's a good one for context. So there's a person standing and there's the shadow. So this is what we're trying to create is that shadow. So you could look through here, you could pick any one uh, or you could use one of the ones that I already have. But just like we did last time, we want to open this up in Photoshop and then kind of analyze the scene. Let me go ahead and open with, where did open with go? There it is, Photoshop. So as we analyze the scene, we can see that our shadow is coming from the upper right corner down to the lower left corner. And so our shadow would be on that side. And it's almost kind of horizontal when we start to set it. So let's bring in a person. And again, we'd be looking for a person that would fit in one of these scenes. So it would be somebody. All right, let's see here. Eh, that one probably could work. Yeah, this has kind of got a strong, strong highlight on the uh, on the right side here. Definite shadow on the left side. I think I'll use this one. So just like we did last time, I'm going to go to File and then Place Embedded. And we're going to bring in that person. So right there. 
And we can kind of tell with the highlights that yes, this will work. So once again, I'm looking for where is the horizon line? And then how large, how close to the camera she is, as long as her eyes are staying roughly on that horizon line, you can choose where she fits in the scene. So this grass is fairly long, but I'm gonna try to put her into the sunny spot in the grass right about there. Maybe about like that. And actually for composition purposes, I should probably put her over here a little bit more. Can you draw the horizon line? Because I, I'm not sure I- uh... Sure. Sure. So the horizon line, let me bring it in with, um, let me go into, oops, ah, that was not what I wanted. Hold on. Sorry. I'm going to show rulers view and then show rulers. And that'll let me draw a guide down. So the horizon line is not quite there. It's usually a little bit higher than where the, when we're looking, if, if we were standing on a beach, the horizon's easy. We'd look out and we'd see wherever the sky meets the sea, that's the true horizon. Uh, these angles are always a little bit harder when you have mountains and stuff in the background. I usually take the, the line of the ground that you can see, and then I go up a little bit more. So if you imagine somebody standing right at that edge of the meadow, and they were probably about that tall, that's about where your horizon would be. It's usually fairly close to the middle of the image because when people take the photograph, they tend to line it up standing. So they're at eye level and looking roughly at the horizon line. So if you were to take a picture. So unless you're getting down on your knees and shooting up at something or you're holding the camera over your head, generally speaking, it's gonna be right at about the middle of the page and you're, you're making adjustments whether it's going downhill or uphill slightly. So I'd say that's right about where the horizon line is. You know, to me, this seems a little too high as a horizon line, because if I imagine somebody standing here, they wouldn't be that tall, they'd be out of proportion. So I'd say it's right about somewhere right in there where I put it. Thanks. Okay. So um, I just want to make sure that her eyes are roughly on that line. So let me come back to my free transform on her, right? And maybe she needs to be a little bit smaller. Again, we're looking for an approximation. She could be standing on a little hill. There's, there's some variance. The key though, is that you're gonna be able to tell, well, that doesn't feel right. She seems too big. Well, that definitely doesn't feel right. She seems way too big. So there's a point at which she feels about right. Now you have to ignore the lower half of the body because she's gonna be covered by grass right in here. So let's say that I kind of like that. I'll go ahead and commit to it. There she is. And let me turn off my uh, guide so they're not distracting us anymore. There we go. And now I need to think about how does she fit into this scene? So if we look at her legs, let me press control plus. Oops, sorry, wrong. Sorry, Mac commands versus Windows commands sometimes get me. There we go. We're gonna hold down spacebar and pan a little bit. I'll press control plus again. There we go. And she definitely feels like she's floating and that uh, her, her, her feet are on top of the grass. So I have to figure out how to get her feet to feel like they're down in the grass somewhere. And so this takes a little bit more, this is much more challenging than say the city scene where we're just on pavement. We don't have to do anything with the feet. Here, we actually have to get these feet down in the grass. And to do that, we're gonna use uh, a clone stamp tool, but we're gonna use a special brush called the grass brush. Now, in order to do it, we're gonna have to copy it onto a new layer because we need the, um, what we create, we need the, the grass to be on top of where she is. So let's go ahead and create a layer. And I'm gonna call this grass cover. Okay, and with that layer selected, we're going to use our clone stamp tool right here. But instead of using our, our traditional brush, we're gonna come down here and we're gonna choose a different brush. Now our brush 
the grass brush, unfortunately, is hidden in the legacy brushes. They, they got rid of it in our default brushes. Let me just make sure that it's gone. Yeah, they got rid of it. I'm just double checking. Yeah, they're basically they hid the bulk of the brushes now. So what we're going to do is this little gear icon right here. We'll click on it, and we're going to choose legacy brushes. And we'll say, OK. Now, if you go into the legacy brushes, which are at the bottom, and then you go to our uh, default brushes, about halfway down on this list is the grass brush. And there it is, grass brush. And so what this brush does is it allows us to copy in the shape of, of grass. <laughs> I know that sounds totally bizarre, but when we go and copy from, so let me hold down the Alt key again. When I copy from, as I start to create the grass, oh, please do it for me. Now I'm gonna have to copy a chunk of grass first. So let me take this little chunk. I'm using the rectangular marquee tool. I'm gonna go to edit, copy. I'm going to jump up. Oops. Sorry, I have to copy it from the background layer. There we go. Edit, copy, go up to my new layer, edit, paste. Looks exactly the same, so don't panic. What I have now is an extra little chunk of grass. I can then use my clone stamp right here with the grass brush. I'm going to copy from, let me hold down the Alt key. I'm going to copy from, and then when I start to go over, see how it's making grass? See those little spires, right? I'm copying over so that her feet now feel like they're inside the, the scene. So when I go to turn back on the background, we can start to see that she's integrated into the scene. I probably copied a little bit too much there. Probably right about like that. And so now, she feels like she's standing in the scene. So let me do that one more time since I felt like I was a little bit confusing there. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a, a chunk of the background right here. I'm gonna copy it. I'll go up to edit and then copy. I'm gonna create a brand new layer, put it on top of everything else. Then I'll go to edit and paste. That gives me some of the, the grass to, to work with. Then I'll use the clone stamp tool. I'll hold down Alt to copy from. And then I'll come over to her feet. And I'll draw some grass right over her feet. Now, depending on the length of the grass, right, we may need to cover up more. We might need to cover up less. But the key is that we want our feet to be covered up by the grass so that she feels like she's standing in the scene. So if I go back here, let me go uh, control zero. Now, instead of feeling like she's on top of the scene, she feels like she's part of the scene. And that's a really important distinction. Now in this particular scene, because she's already kind of in the shadows here a little bit, we could get away with probably just this. Alternatively though, let's try to put that shadow into place. And it really, I think she needs to go, I want her in the, the sun here so we can see it a little bit better. So let me do it one more time with her. And I'm gonna move her. A little bit further, I want her out here in the sun. So even though this is a little bit small, I'll just zoom in so you can see it better. There we go. Okay, so same thing. I'm going to do that clone stamp again. Let me do a, let me go click on the background layer and I make a copy of that sunny patch. We'll go to edit and then copy. And then I'll create another layer again on top of everything else. And let's call this foot cover. And then on that new layer, we will paste it. I'll go to edit and then paste. And then I'll use the clone stamp tool 
Again, on that foot cover layer, I'll hold down Alt, copy from, and we'll cover up her feet like that. Like that. So now she feels like she's in the scene, but now she's out in the sun. This way we have to deal with her shadow. Okay, so let's bring in her shadow. Let's go to File and then Place Embedded. And like I said, this takes a lot more uh, work with this grass. So let's take her shadow, let's place her in. We obviously need to shrink her shadow down. Oops. All right, so we're fairly close. I'll go ahead and commit to it. And then once again, I have to skew this shadow so it's down and to the left. So let me go up to edit, go to transform, and then we'll go to skew. And we'll work our way over into this shadow. All right, now the advantage here is that the shadow is really so skewed that we're not seeing that much of the shape anymore. Right, we're just seeing that dark patch. So if we look at this, all right, let me go ahead and commit to it. We've got our shadow and we can of course do what we did before where we can come in here and we can go to multiply and now that's seeing through and then we could adjust our opacity so that it feels like one of the other shadows. But as we look at this, it looks very sharp on the edges. And even if we did a blur on those edges, it wouldn't quite feel right. So this is where we actually have to work with, and I'm going to turn everything else off. We're going to have to work with the shadow. Let me bring it back up to 100% just so you can see it a little bit better. And on that shadow, we're going to have to change the texture on the edges. Let me press Control Plus to zoom in here a little bit. I'm going to hold down the spacebar key. And so what we would want if, is we would want the front of this shadow to be covered up with white grass. And we want the back of this shadow to have some little spikes that are covered up with this gray color. So I know that this is a lot to take in and this is probably the hardest thing that we'll do. We will come back and revisit this later on in the semester. So if you don't quite get it today, we will have other opportunities for it. However, it's worth showing you. So I'm gonna go ahead and rasterize this layer because it's still a linked file. So I'm going to right click and say rasterize layer. That lets me work on the layer itself. And then I'll use the clone stamp again, but I need this gray color to copy from. So let me come over here. I'm going to create a little selection there. I'm going to use my eyedropper to copy this gray. And then I'll go ahead and paint it into this box. And let's make my brush bigger here, just to make this a little bit faster, and we'll paint that in. We're going to delete this later on. I'll select my rectangular marquee, and I'll click somewhere on the page to deselect everything. And then I'm going to choose my clone stamp tool. So we still have the grass brush, but notice that it's really, really large. So we need to make that much smaller, right about like that. I'm going to hold down Alt on the keyboard. There we go copy from this gray area, and I'm gonna add grass to the upper edge of this shadow. I'm not gonna worry about the lower edge of the shadow. We're just gonna work our way along the upper edge of the shadow like that. Copy from back here, and we'll work our way along. Now, if this was too small, we could increase the brush size. It kind of depends on the grass, something like that. The key is that we want the edge of the shadow to go away. Now, because this shadow is so long, I have to kind of recopy my positions here so that I can get the whole thing in. Why did you uh, need to do the rectangle? Why did you uh, because I need, copy I need the color. color from the shadow? Well, the way the clone stamp tool works, if I'm going to use this brush, is I have to copy from something. And the brush, if I were to use just the regular brush tool with that grass brush on it, it will integrate both white and gray 
as you paint with it. So see how I paint, see how it gives the lighter and darker colors? Yes. It doesn't work like the clone stamp. We're just looking for the shadow. So we're looking to copy it. So in order to copy it, I need the gray to copy from. So I create that gray box to be able to just copy the gray. Almost but done. But you couldn't copy the gray from the shadow itself? Uh, well, it's too difficult because you'd run out of space as you were trying to do it. Okay. So yes, it would copy it. But if I was in here and I held down Alt and I tried to copy it, it would copy the hard edges too. Mm, okay. See, like that. It doesn't quite do as good of a job. Okay, so now what I'll do is I'll replace this rectangle. And instead of having gray this time, I'm going to replace it with white. So let's use white as my fill color. I'll use my brush. I can just do a standard brush. There. There we go. And we'll paint that in white. And I'll come back to the clone stamp again. Hold on, let me deselect here. I'll come back to my clone stamp. I'm going to copy from the white and I'll work in front to add the grass texture in front. Let me make this slightly smaller. There we go. And so we're just covering the front of this shadow with the grass. Now, this is obviously an approximation. It's no longer really representing what the shadow looked like. Okay, almost there. But I've taken the general shape of the shadow and I've transformed it to have a grass texture on the front edge and the back edge. And remember that the white on a multiply layer becomes transparent. So when we come in here and we turn, remember it's on multiply, when we turn on the background, our shadow shows up with all of our little grass brushes on it. Then we could turn back on the foot cover. We could turn back on the woman walking. And there she is with her little bit of a shadow. Now, in reality, I probably should cover a little bit more. Hold down alt here. Probably need a little bit more of that being covered up. Like that. Perfect. Now let's turn the rest of the background back on. There we go. Let me press command or control zero. And now you can see that she has her shadow being cast. Uh, that's a little bit strong still. I'm going to turn that down to right about there. And so we're able to create her shadow. It wouldn't work if we didn't have those little grass brushes on the side. That's the hardest part, is creating those little grass brushes on the side of the shadow. So I like to tell you about it now. It's kind of the ultimate challenge of what we're doing today. So if you can do it, that's fantastic. If it doesn't really work out, that's okay. Remember, this is designed to be a two-hour thing. So start with the cityscape, work your way through that, move into the, the scene, do your best to at least get to the point where you've got the person integrated even without a shadow. So you've got the grass covering the feet and then give an attempt on the shadow if you can. Like I said, we'll revisit this a little bit later on in um, the semester. So it won't be the last time that you see this, uh, but this is kind of the ultimate of trying to combine things together. So I know today was long. It was a lot to take in. I will do my best to have this video up quickly so that you can go back. You can also, of course, watch a previous semester um, because I do the same thing. I go through the same process. Um, but this is kind of the next key to what you need to do when it comes to uh, your, uh, your assignment 102. So in terms of integrating images, et cetera. Uh, the last thing that I'll remind you is your assignment 101 is due tonight at midnight. So it wasn't due last night, it's due tonight at midnight. So during our lab check-ins today, if you have any questions, last minute questions you wanna talk about, that's fine. And I'm just checking to make sure I didn't miss any questions there. Yep, we're good. Um, so that being said, we'll come back at 9.10. That gives us a 10 minute break um, for our first check-ins. Uh, this is a fresh week, it's Monday. So all of you do need to do a check-in for this week. So you can come today or you can come on Wednesday, your choice. And I'll see you all then. Does anybody have any Global questions before I let you go. No, perfect. Okay, I'll see my first check-in group back in 10 minutes. Thank you.